my relationship with the River Nar goes back as long as I can remember. Um, my mother's family had a house on the Fens at the lower end of the river, and I can remember it since I was a small boy when my grandfather took me fishing down there. And going back even further, my great-grandfather managed a brewery on the lower River Nar at Sechi. So I really do feel the river is very connected personally to me. The key thing with this project here, what we're trying to achieve, is to reconnect the river to the floodplain. So often chalk streams have been divorced from their floodplain, from their wider landscape, and that was the case here. So it was a question of rolling back on the changes that had taken place to the river over hundreds of years ago and putting the river back where it used to be. It's so important to connect a river to its surrounding landscape, not least a chalk stream, because they're such gentle rivers that when pollutants get into them, if that river is divorced from its surrounding landscape, that pollutant stays in the river. Put it back in contact with the floodplain, which means putting the river bed in the right relationship to the floodplain surface, and that river will flood during the winter. And that's so key, because then it can put up onto the floodplain a lot of the pollutant that came into it, can flush itself clean, but also you get this much more gentle gradation from the, from the land habitat to the river habitat and everything that lies somewhere on that margin between the two. And that's really key for biodiversity in chalk streams. The planning of these works is almost like a piece of detective work. And that's what I really enjoy about it. It's sort of natural history mystery how the river got into that shape. And so you have to really, you have to look at maps, you have to look at aerial images, you have to come out here with surveying equipment and note down the levels of the floodplain relative to the riverbed. You want to make sure that when you choose your path and you dig down, you find the gravel where you want it to be. So I developed this highly technical way of, um, of working that out, which is to get a metal pin and to walk backwards and forwards across the floodplain, driving it into the ground. And when I hit something solid, I took a note of how deep it was. And you build up an underground contour map of where the gravel and the sand and the aggregate is at approximately the right level. And that's your working corridor, which I drew on a map. But then you've got to put a meandering channel, or in the case of this project, actually, meandering channels down that corridor with the right meander pattern, which you've deduced from all this forensic work you've done into looking at the old meanders that used to exist before we changed the river so much. So I got a bit of fly line and to scale, I marked it with black dots with a marker pen every, every 35 meters in the case of this river, which was where you had your inflection points between one meander and the next. And then I put the fly line on my piece of paper and I taped it down and then I put a bend in it and then I put another bit of tape down until I had what looked to me like a natural channel. And I spend a lot of time on Google Earth looking at natural chalk streams. And you can kind of see when it looks right. And that's how I got that meandering pattern. And that's when we started digging. The Water Management Alliance and Norfolk Rivers Drainage Board are the flood risk management authority for this water course. We take great pride and care in being able to um, manage and where possible improve um, our water courses. This is obviously a very special chalk stream habitat and um, we've been involved in this project as not only holding the budget and the purse strings but also our contractors have completed the work so we have acted as principal contractor um, throughout, the, throughout the construction phase. The Water Management Alliance has changed um, significantly over past decade plus really. Um, we are a lot more involved in looking at restoration projects, working with natural processes in order to not only be able to restore the habitat and environments but also help uh, manage flood risk by connecting rivers back up to their natural floodplains and increasing storage capacity within the system. Here on the River Nar, we look after the river which is 25 kilometres in length upstream of Narbra. It's really important uh, chalk stream habitat and that whole length is designated SSSI 
for how important the habitat is. So we do take great sort of pride really in looking after that habitat, but not only managing it, but looking to improve it where we can. So we've, we've moved away from a maintenance emphasis to improvement and restoration. The moment of truth in a project like this is when you let the water down through the channel. And it is quite an emotional moment as well because parts of this channel, although we've reinvented parts, parts I'm certain were the original channel, long since abandoned, really without much in the way of flow for hundreds of years. And then you let the water down for the first time and that is really significant. It's also good fun, you know, it's like when you're a kid and you're playing with a dam and you break it open at the end and the water rushes through and it feels very powerful. But also you know it's the start of something. And uh, so that day is always a bit of a champagne on the bow of a ship moment when the digger finally just comes and he just takes those last few sections away and the river just pours down this channel and things start happening. Chalk streams are really gentle rivers. And now that we haven't really got beavers anymore, although we've got beavers coming back, there's only one thing that interacts with a chalk stream in such a way as to really turbocharge the processes, and that's trees, especially when trees fall in, because they can fall in and block the flow and force the river to find a new pathway or blow the river, make the river blow a hole underneath. And that puts a lot of energy and material into the system. So after the machines have gone, we wanted to put timber and we actually wanted to put more timber into the channel, but we couldn't afford to damage the floodplain. So we hit upon this idea of using Archie, the heavy horse, lovely gentle animal that just wanted to graze all the time, but he just could shift some timber. So we would load his cart with, you know, quite a few lumps of big lumps of wood and off he would go and then we would dump them off off the cart at each corner and then he'd loop round and come back and carry some more up and uh, we had Archie here for about five days and he, <laughs> he saved us an awful lot of trouble and work. So we put an awful lot of timber into the stream and that creates that dynamic variety of habitat and uh, the sort of forcing of processes. Well, they, they give grit to the project and how they become little islands of habitat in their own right. We decided to get quite serious on it here. So we put some bits of oak that had fallen onto the forest floor that weighed several tons, big, big root wads. And they're like little islands now. All the seed beds come, got caught in the bark, grown up, and they're incredible ecosystems in their own right. But you go away and you've really only just started the process. What happens then is nature moves in and the, the plants, the animals, the insects and the fish and the flowing water take over. And 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, they're doing their thing and they're turning your rather crude sketch into something that looks like it's been here forever, hopefully. That's what I always want to aim for, for a river that doesn't look like man put it there, but looks like nature put it there. And that's the magic. The thing I'm always told about with river projects is you've got to monitor them and you've got to assess what they've actually achieved. So we've got five years of monitoring, which the Norfolk Rivers Trust are doing for us. And already that's giving us some really encouraging results. The most key to my mind, perhaps because I'm a fisherman, but the fish community, the trout community is showing all size classes. So we've now got lots and lots of young fish and we've got a handful of really big fish that have all kind of voted with their fins and taken up residence in this area. I also, coming at it from a sort of artist point of view, sometimes I think, I don't need to monitor it. I can see whether it looks good or not. You know, I just, if I look at a river, I know whether it's right or whether it isn't. There are parts of this project where I walk up and I think, yeah, we've got that right, and nature is now gonna take over. 
I think this kind of work, putting the river back where, where it belongs in the floodplain and giving it the shape that the river wants to have and unleashing those natural forces is, is really, really key in, in river restoration. And I feel it's kind of this idea of process-based river restoration where we as practitioners do what we need to do to then unleash those forces, the ecological engineers. That I feel is the fundamental philosophy. And then we all need to be pushing at the edge of that in terms of the possibilities and learning from each other. Since doing this work, I've had a few workshops here with people from Rivers Trusts in Hertfordshire and on the River Kennet. They're going away now to plan their own projects along these lines. And I'm really looking forward in a year or two time to go and see what they've done and bring that knowledge back here to Norfolk to get stuck into the next Chalkstream project.